Hey everyone, I'm Sarah New, Executive Director here, all pronouns okay with me. I'm actually on vacation this week, so I'm just mailing in my video to our wonderful technical team led by Robbie Klein. Um, so I'll, that's why I'm not in the comments, that's why I'm absent, but um, it's going to be a great sermon, hopefully. I'm going to kick off our new Sunday series on work and capitalism. I think the official title is whatever the team decides. Um, and we're kind of wrapping up our series. Sorry, that's my cat. He's very great, very cute. Hopefully we'll make a cameo, um, more frontal cameo. Um, we're, we're wrapping up a series on powers and principalities. And so this series on work and capitalism is one that actually is very personally meaningful for me um, because of a pretty bad boss experience that I had. And I'm sure most of us have had bad boss experiences or bad bosses. Uh, if you haven't, awesome, you're very lucky. Um, and although I was, I know I've been a freelancer for the past several years, but I used to have kind of a boss boss um, when I was a full-time employee. And, and it was a very bad kind of toxic, abusive relationship. Um, and the, it was very hard kind of to read the Bible for a variety of reasons during that time in my life. But the only part of the Bible that really I could read were the Psalms, in particular Psalm 10. And that's going to be our primary text for today. And I'm going to tell a bit about my story to give you some context. Um, and through it out, I'm going to weave in excerpts and selections from Psalm 10. Most of it will be read out, but I'm just going to kind of weave it in sequentially. So, you know, once again, as context, the, the company I worked for was a sort of ethical capitalist, you know, do good, social good kind of company and a nice mission attracted a lot of people who want to do good like me. And my boss happened to be the CEO and he would regularly make, you know, people, you know, in their 30s and their 40s break down in tears because of how ruthless and personal and psychological his criticism would be. Every morning, I, you know, this young 20-something would wake up, go to work, and just be in dread, uh, not knowing, you know, what small mistake I would make that he would kind of pounce on and really blow out of proportion. And so here are the first four verses from Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked persecute the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes they have devised. For the wicked boast of the desires of their heart, those greedy for gain curse and renounce the Lord. In the pride of their countenance, the wicked say, God will not seek it out. All their thoughts are, there is no God. You can see that, you know, over and over again in this psalm, the narrative is stressing over and over again that the wicked believe in their hearts that there is no God. And that what essentially means is that there is no accountability, that there's no law or power above them that will rein in and check their behavior. That was kind of a little bit my situation in that workplace because HR reported to the CEO, the board was full of his kind of personal friends and investors. And so there was no accountability and there was no real separation between his ego and the mission. So, you know, if the mission was 24-7, work was 24-7, he was obsessed over it 24-7. So, for instance, after Thanksgiving, I was, you know, I returned back to the office working on a project, and he turned to me and said, Sarah, what did you do for the mission during your Thanksgiving break? And I was like, uh, nothing. You know, just talked to my grandma, did not make any progress on this project we're working on together, and he was like, you know, that's disappointing, Sarah, or something like that. And... Even during weekends, especially if there was like an upcoming deadline, I would have my phone on me in case there was an emergency phone call or email, which, you know, especially there would be if there was something coming up. And obviously we would never paid overtime. And so the mission, because it was 24-7, like I said, the work was 24-7. And I really, really believe, and this is something I think a lot of my friends who've worked in nonprofits can attest to as well, that sometimes the more, you know, moral, ethical the mission of an organization is, the more exploitative it is. Um, because the boss gets to feel like they're not the ones demanding that their workers work. It's the mission that's demanding it. And so, and also, you know, it's not exploitation if you love what you do, you know, that, that kind of false log logic. What's interesting, though, is that although we were expected to be motivated for the mission and not for the money, Somehow he had both. Um, 
you know, I was happened to be close with his executive assistants. And so I would know, you know, when he casually decided to drop some money to purchase a suit, um, that would be basically the total cost of my annual salary. Or I would know when his son would complain about getting picked up by a private, uh, by a cat in a cab, as opposed to with their private driver. And I knew all that, yet he kind of worked to make us feel grateful whenever we received a small raise on the, you know, low, low salaries we were given, especially given the amount of hours we were expected to work. I see that Bo has really settled in there. Don't think I can move my camera, so he's just gonna be in that frame. Hopefully that's not too much of a distraction for you. So I'm gonna read verses five through seven, cause, you know, and you'll see how they really resonated with me. The wicked man's ways prosper at all times. Your judgments, referring to God, are on high, out of his sight. As for his foes, he scoffs at them. He thinks in his heart, we shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, we shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. In this guy's eyes, working at this company was like the best job in the world. Like who wouldn't love it? And if you indicated you didn't quite feel that way and you were honest about why you didn't feel that way, namely he sucked, it would be like calling the emperor naked. And most of us just because he was pretty powerful and successful, we're just like scared, like we were just scared of him. And so it, it took me a while to work up the courage to tell him that I wanted to leave in the spring. It was sometime during the fall at that point in time. And he responded by telling me that he was disappointed that his investment in me uh, did not pay off, that he expected me to work in the company for another four or five years or maybe the rest of my career. And so I was failing to produce the full fruits of his investment as if because he, you know, quote unquote, invested in me like an asset, he owned me and owned my labor. And he said, you know, once again, playing the guilt card, Sarah, if you, you know, quit, you're going to leave your team in the lurch. How is that morally responsible? You have to find your replacement, train him or her, and, you know, before you're, you can leave. Uh, so it was, I still had some time, so I did that. I, I was also very young. So I found a replacement, trained him, replaced me. And I had another conversation and said, okay, and now I want to leave um, about end of January. It was around December at this time. And he said, you know, Sarah, I'm only saying this to you because I know you're a person of values, integrity. Um, but January is not spring and you went back on your word. So, <laughs> I mean, looking back now, it's almost like laughable how gaslighty and manipulative his behavior was. But, you know, back then, it was difficult not to let it get to me, to not think I'm really bad at my job because I'm getting I like 10 pretty intense criticisms for every one positive comment. Or not think, wow, I messed up, I'm guilty, I'm a liar, I broke promises, whatever, because I was made to feel so. And like I said, he was a very successful, powerful person. So he, and he was like friends and networked with all these successful and powerful people. So he really had all these tools at his disposal to make his narrative of reality more believable than mine. Verse eight through 10. The wicked man's eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed sink down and fall by his might. If you just zoom out a little bit when I think about my experience, I really had very little institutional recourse. Not only was HR beholden to him, but legally, unless I can prove I was explicitly discriminated against based on my identity, the law has really little to help or protect me. And in fact, if he was like, all right, I want everyone to do 10 jumping jacks, and 10 push-ups right now every day, he would be basically totally within his legal rights. Um, and although, you know, obviously most of the people who were in senior leadership and close with him, almost everyone were like older white men. And I'm very sure that my social location as, you know, the queer, masculine, uh, Asian American woman affected how he treated me. The truth is it was like generally terrible to everyone, except for those he knew he had to please. And it was through that experience that I sort of realized 
that although my boss was obviously kind of like way worse than many others um, and good bosses do exist, the workplace is generally set up, in my opinion, as a tyranny where one person has the power to greatly determine the economic livelihood of someone else, especially if it's a full-time employee. And that gives them so much power over someone else. And if you have a great boss, that's great. But that's basically the equivalent of a benevolent dictatorship. The only leverage that we workers have um, is not money or power, but numbers. And so, if, you know, if we organize collectively for fair wages, for hours, you know, otherwise known as union, then we have some leverage. But otherwise, you know, I was just fighting my battle alone in my corner. And my colleague was fighting her own battle in her corner. And we were just fighting separately. And so our, our fights were doomed to fail just because of the power imbalance, because we were not working really together in that fight. God, I would say at that time, felt far away. You know, I, I'm going to repeat the first few lines of that psalm. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Their ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of their sight. That last line in particular, I think, is really resonant. The idea that these you know, abstractions of God loves you, your love, justice, and truth, and peace, just felt really like detached from my reality, really high, really aloof, too ideal. And when I look back on that time in my life and think about how I got through it, um, you know, I think I did so partly because of my partner who was really a rock, um, and also partly because of religion. And I say religion specifically, not faith. Um, because at that time, my faith in God was a little like on the rocks. Like I felt close to God, but I also thought at the time that God was like not cool with the gay. So me and God were kind of like, eh. Um, so what really I think helped save me was not this intimate, spiritual, robust faith, but like the practices and rituals of religion. Basically, almost every night before I went to bed, I would turn off the lights, I would light some candles, um, I would play medieval music, uh, you know, Catholic, Latin chants, Hildegard von Bingen, like whatever, whatever, you know, I could find on Spotify, basically. And I would kind of face this white poster I had with the names of God as mentioned in the Bible and we just meditate on it and those things really helped me transport myself out of my current reality into you know what I believe and still believe is true reality reality in which God reigned and not my boss and in which I was beloved and worthy and not like worthless and dependent on my performance Obviously, like these things are things I knew then intellectually, but just wasn't really sinking in. I had to really like spell it through the candles. I had to see it through the names on the poster. I had to, you know, like hear it in the music. I had to do all I could to change what was happening out externally in my senses so that what so that I could change internally, so that something inside me could shift. I had to, you know really physically immerse myself in a deeper reality in order to remind myself this is real and what you're experiencing outside of this is not. So, you know, for 12 hours a day, I was kind of at the mercy of a tyrant. But for those 30 minutes at night, I was held. And I really hope and my prayer really is that you know, whatever is going through, going on right now in your work life, or whether you have a bad boss, or maybe you're unemployed, what have you, or you know, there are tyrants in all kinds of context relationships in our marriages and in our friendships. Um, I hope that at church, even for these these few hours, that reality will be true. That reality will override any other narrative of reality um, that is playing in your head, or that others are trying to impose upon you. In particular, I really loved, um, as I mentioned, Psalm 10 because of the last paragraph. So I'm just going to read it aloud. O oh Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that the man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. That last line, which is uh, in the ESV, by the way, is so perfect. Because it did two things. On one hand, it reminded me that my boss was ultimately a man of the earth. 
And I served a god who ruled over all space and time. And it also, for the second thing, validated my experience and gave me a name for it, which is kind of what, it was, what I was experiencing was something really close to a kind of terror of not knowing um, what was set off, you know, his temper, his anger that day. And in this psalm, and I'm going to switch my uh, sermon to be more focused on the, on the text here. The psalmist in particular is really concerned around who sees what happening. So one thing that we notice in, in, in the text I've just read out is that the wicked man or the wicked people, depending on the translation, um, do not commit their violence out in the open, but in stealth. If you notice how many times I used the word, I don't know, you heard the words like lurking in ambush, crouching in hiding places, um, mouth full of deceit. Uh, another line, just, just be really explicit about it. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. So what we see here is really a visual of opposites. On one hand, you have the sort of all-seeing, stealthy, low-to-the-ground gaze of the wicked. Con- contrast it with God, who's like really high up, you know, judgments are super high, aloof, absent, hidden. And I think what is breaking the psalmist's heart is not just the terror of the wicked, but the perceived absence of God. I'm just going to repeat those lines again. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The turning point in the psalm is towards the end in verse 14. I encourage you to pull it up if you, you know, have your Bible next to you or just um, like a little app or browser. Where the psalmist says, addressing God. But you do see, indeed, you know trouble and grief that you may take it into your hands. The helpless commit themselves to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. A turning phrase is so important. You do see. Psalmist is kind of like reminding the people, God sees, God is bearing witness. God sees what is going on. God sees your suffering. And the psalmist then calls for God to take action. Here it is. Break the arm of the wicked and evil doers. Seek out their wickedness until you find none. Psalmist wants justice for the tools of the wicked to be broken and for wickedness to be gone. So we have two actors in the psalm who are seeing. The rich and the powerful who kind of watch stealthily in the shadows. And God who sees on high. But there is a third actor who is seeing and watching. Any guesses who? I'm not live, so I'm just going to answer my question without reading out anyone's comments. Um, the narrative. The narrative could be a single person, but some commentaries believe that it's it's chorus of people or a representative of a group of people, you know, namely the poor who are oppressed and exploited by the wicked. When you think about it, the narrator sees everything that the wicked are doing. They see the wicked lying in ambush. They see the wicked lying stealthily in the dark, crouching, waiting to pounce on and laying traps for the poor. They even hear when the wicked say to themselves, there is no God. The narrators note the trouble and the grief of the poor. And I, you know, the truth is that although the power will think that they have no accountability, that they can get away with anything, The truth is that they are being watched and listened to by their nannies who are in their dining rooms and who listen to their conversations and and whom they pay under the table, by their executive assistants who have access to the inboxes and who they don't pay overtime, by their private drivers who hear every conversation that is said in the car and who are expected to be on call 24-7 by service and domestic workers and waiters and cleaners and so forth who are treated as invisible but because of that have the ability to see more than people think they see. And when I reflect on my job, really the main thing, to be honest, that got me through it and the best part of my job that I actually enjoyed was working with my team. Which, you know, we happen to be mostly women uh, and or people of color. And, you know, we sat a few feet, most of us, away from the CEO, and so we would hear what happened. And, 
we during our meetings behind closed doors, we would just talk smack about him. We would just joke about him, make fun of him, uh, and just talk about how absurd his behavior was, like what his latest tam- tamper tantrum was. And that was how, in many ways, we looked out for one another. That's how we kept each other grounded in reality. When we said to ourselves, we were able to tell each other, you're not crazy, he is. Don't blame yourself. So as hard as my former boss then worked to tear down our reality, we worked even harder to build it back up brick by brick. And to say to each other, I see you, I'm bearing witness to you, you're not going through this alone, I got you. So even though God felt complicated and distant, I really believe that God was real to me in those meetings through the coworkers um, I shared at that time. Because before them, when I would walk into the meeting, I might be feeling dejected, deflated, like a smaller version of myself. But after those meetings, after that, just that experience of being seen and seeing others, I would walk out with maybe a smile on my face even. I felt like empowered and rejuvenated, even if it just lasted for you know however long. And so that's my question to all of us today. Like, what are you seeing? What are you bearing witness to in your workplace in particular? Do you notice if someone might be suffering like you are, if you're feeling like you're suffering? Do you notice if there are, you know, certain patterns and how those in power treat others? If, you know, if your, your boss tends to, for instance, mostly criticize the women of color in your team? Do you notice who gets tagged as like a troublemaker, as aggressive? Do you notice um, how assignments gets distributed? Do you notice who informally gets called in for like quick huddles and meetings and consultations? Do you notice um, who takes notes, who sends reminders, who does all the kind of invisible work to keep an office and a team going? Do you notice like whether there is pay equity in your workplace. Do you know how bonuses are distributed if they distribute them? So pay attention, bear witness, take a look, and maybe even take a coworker aside and say, hey, you know, I've been noticing so-and-so, what do you think? Should we maybe do something together instead of just kind of going at it alone? And see what happens in that conversation that conversation could really make a break someone's day, um, make them think, make them realize, well, I'm not, I'm not crazy here. This is, this is a pattern. This is not about me. This is about my boss. And my prayer for us all today is that we um, may be the eyes and the ears and the hands of God for one another, um, that we may bear witness together. God, I thank you that you are a God who sees. That even in moments in which we feel distant from you, you are bearing witness. And that you see us through the people who show up in our lives, who bear witness to us and who reflect back our pain and who lift us up. May we give unto others what has been given to us. May we... Yeah, be the eyes, hands, and ears of God to one another. Maybe we bear witness for one another so that those who are of the earth may strike terror no more. Amen.